Hello everyone, thank you for coming back to the channel, The Zero Percent. Today I wanted to talk about um, some of the tax haven benefits that a lot of corporations or companies are utilizing to reduce their tax liability. As you know, those of you that are inside of the Patreon course, you are establishing your express trust, which is uh, foreign to the United States. And upon doing that, what you are supposed to receive is, well, you're entering into the zero tax liability, uh, the zero tax bracket, the 0% bracket, so to speak. And this is something that corporations are utilizing as well on top of having their businesses inside of the tax havens, such as Belize here, or the, the Netherlands is another one of them. There are so many of them. And you know, I think Belize is the, the best one. Um, there is 1% or less at times. It depends on the tax classification or the service classification that you are uh, doing business in. However, um, what I want to talk about today is showing how you can perfect your copyrights because that is something that corporations are utilizing they have a copyright an intellectual property copyright which is further perfected by what's called a trademark or a marks of attention and so let's look at this article here because i'm going to read it here and it's going to we're going to walk you down a few case laws to actually back up the importance of the common law copyright, which is going to go into the Copyright Act of 1790. Further by, we'll look at some case law um, and to see how this differentiates because there are companies out there that are LLCs and corporations that use this. Um, and then we, on the other end, we have the Express Trust, which is considered a natural person. And we're going to look at information or, or proof that backs up why being an express trust is better than just utilizing an LLC on its own. In fact, you, you actually want to have the express trust on top or be the owner, the beneficial owner of your existing LLC, S or C corporation, limited liability partnership, general partnership, or what have you. So, it says, since January 2019, Belize has incorporated a new tax regime, which has led to the collapse of the zero tax haven regime. In simple words, all Belize international companies, IBCs, whether tax residents or non-tax residents, are now liable for income taxes for carrying out a trade, business, or service inside of Belize. IBCs, which are not resident in Belize for tax purposes must collectively satisfy the below. No physically present or not physically present in Belize. The source of income occurs outside of Belize and tax liable in other jurisdictions. IBCs are now ob obligated. I, I, like, I think this is uh, not written the best. I think we can agree. IBCs are now obliged or obligated to file annual tax returns, accounting records pursuant to the requirement of the Income and Business Tax Act. IBCs that are physically present in Belize must also file and pay monthly business tax. Tax returns should be filed accompanied by financials. Financials can be internally generated, but audited financials should be presented when requested by the director general. Applicable tax rates, 1.75% of chargeable income of companies whose gross receipts from business operations are greater than 3 million Belize dollars or 3% of companies whose gross receipts are lower than 3, 3 million Belize dollars. So, there has been, I don't know if you've seen it um, on social media, it's, it's pretty much all over. A lot of people are, who are considering themselves to be financial gurus 
are talking about um, one company specifically called Nike. Uh, Nike has stores all over and there are, there are a billion dollar company, right? Um, most people follow a, a, a man named Andrew Tate and he talked about Nike as well. The fact that they have a tax haven um, in Belize, they actually have a trademark for the Nike Swoop, the logo that everyone knows. They have a trademark where, where they own that mark. And so in Europe, where they have most of their stores, they've generated an amount of 150 billion, I believe, to escape the tax burden or the tax liability that they would have to pay in Europe, they would actually have a bill. They would owe a debt to the subsidiary in Belize because Belize will have that trademark. And so now, once that bill and the money of $150 billion has been transmitted to Belize, uh, Nike in Belize has to worry about the taxes in Belize to the Belize government, which is 1.75% or, or even less, which is much less than what they would have to pay in Europe. So how do they escape the 1.75%? Well, that's where the express trust comes into play because express trusts don't pay taxes. Little known secret, right? Express trusts do not pay taxes. So let's move forward. I want to look into what a common law copyright is. This is just Wikipedia. Um, I know it's people don't like to use this, but check out the sources before we discredit anything. And the sources here are, are actually good. So common law copyright, it is the legal doctrine that grants copyright protection based on common law of various jurisdictions, rather than through protection of statutory law. In part, it is based on the contention that copyright is a natural right. I want you to keep this word in your mind, natural right. And creators are therefore entitled to the same protections anyone would be in regard to tangible and real property. The proponents of this doctrine contended that creators had a perpetual right to control the publication of their work. The natural right aspect of the doctrine was addressed by the courts in the United Kingdom. And you can look at Donaldson versus Beckett in 1774 and the United States, Wheaton versus Peter in 1834. In both countries, the courts found that copyright is a limited right under statutes. Remember, express trust is not governed by statutes. That's why they're saying the copyright is limited under statutes. Now, if you look at these two cases here, you see Wheaton versus Peters and you see Donaldson versus Beckett. Nowhere do you see Donaldson versus such and such express trust. This is an artificial entity versus another artificial entity. And therefore, when you look at these cases, you're going to see that they are under, they're accepting the scrutiny of being an artificial entity uh, going back and forth, not obtaining that common law copyright right that is backed by the Constitution. So in both countries, the courts found that Copyright is a limited right under statutes and subject to the conditions and terms the legislature sees fit to impose. The legislatures, which is the states. The decision in the UK did not, however, directly rule on whether copyright was a common law copyright. Okay, so let's, again, let's focus on this natural right. Okay, what does that mean? This is actually coming from the Constitution. And I'm gonna select California, which means we'll go to 1849 Constitution. Article one, the Declaration of Rights, section nine, talks about you having copyrights. Now, when we talk about copyrights, what are we, what are we copywriting? What is to be copywritten? Or what are we gonna obtain a trademark on? 
to further perfect our copyright? Well, that is the certificated security, which is the birth certificate. This is a part of the process of perfecting that certificate of title because that is what the governments are utilizing to have a some form of control over you where they're abandoning your rights protected by the constitution because that name that is on the birth certificate is considered an ens legis that is a latin phrase a latin word the ens legis uh, in simpler uh, terms look at look at that as a sub corporation the united states is a federal corporation that has many sub corporations let's say i am the owner of subway corporation well, there are many people out there that can go and get a loan for about $400,000 and start a, a franchise. And they can open up a Subway uh, storefront in all over the, across the, the nation, including other countries. That is what you call a sub-corporation, where all of them are paying a tribute, a tax, a franchise fee, dues, impositions to me. And that is what is happening when it comes to state taxes, uh, violations when they pull you over for traffic citations where there was no injured party. All of that is backed by that sub-corporation name on the birth certificate. Okay, so that is what we're going to copyright. And you are the only one that can do that. They cannot copyright or trademark it. So in the course, you find out exactly how to do the copyright. And now we're going to perfect that with a trademark. Doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to do this with the United States Patent Department. Um, you will see that to do or perfect a trademark, that is done within your state. It all begins where the problem existed. So it has to go back to the state. Your copyright is done in the county, and the trademark is going to be with the Secretary of State. And I will show you how to fill out this specific application, which in California should be very generic for all other states as well. So in Section 9 here, it talks about every citizen may freely speak, write, and publish his sentiments on all subjects, being responsible for the abuse of that right, and no law and no law shall be passed to restrain or abridge the liberty of speech or of the press. Now, why does this apply to us when it talks about the press? I'm sure most of you know that when you file an affidavit or if you get married, uh, you, to apply for a marriage license, you're filling out an application which is in turn an affidavit. That application is then published in the local newspaper just like you creating a new business and you have to get a DBA or a fictitious name registration. That affidavit is published in the no local newspaper. That is what you call the press. So yes, you are doing business with the press. Section nine applies to you. Therefore, your natural right is derived right here in the Declaration of Rights to do a common law copyright. Common law is the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Rights. Most people do not know where to look for common law. They don't know where it is. It is not the entire Constitution. It is just that specific section. That is the common law. Bill of Rights or either Declaration of Rights. Okay. A natural right is here within the Declaration of Rights. Now, back in February 22nd, 2019, when the cabinet of Donald Trump was still in office, they had issued uh, House Joint Resolution 48, and it clarifies who indeed is a natural person and what do they have. Let me zoom in here for you says here, this is a, a um, they are proposing an amendment to the Constitution of the United States, providing that the rights extended by the Constitution 
are the rights of natural persons only. All this time, you think that you, John Bill Smith, has rights, have rights protected by the Constitution. And here it's saying, if you are not a natural person, then you do not have rights protected by the Constitution. Heck, if you don't even know what kind of rights you have, then how can you even know what to protect? Section one, the rights protected by the Constitution of the United States are the rights of natural persons only. Artificial entities such as corporations, limited liability companies, or other entities, like I said before, limited partnerships, limited liability partnerships or general partnerships. There are others out there that are considered the classification of other. Sole proprietorships, that's another one. Um, your certificated security, which is the birth certificate. Your uncertificated security, which is the social security number. All of those are entities, artificial entities. And it says here, all of these entities that are established by the laws of any state, capital S, this is every state that has been under the act of session, ceding over their jurisdiction to Washington, D.C., the United States, Washington, D.C., or any foreign state. Now, this is lowercase. Look at the distinction here. This is lowercase meaning country nation, California nation, Nevada nation, Oregon nation, Nebraska nation. These are the several independent states that are part of the union of the United States of America and Congress assembled, not the United States. And it says, artificial entities shall have no rights under this constitution and are subject to regulation by the people through federal, state, or local law. Do you see that? The privileges of artificial entities shall be determined by the people through federal, state, or local law and shall not be construed to inherit, to be inherent or inalienable. This means common law. This is referring to the common law. So if you are an artificial entity, you have no rights protected by the constitution. Now, what is a natural person? Well, if we were to look at uh, one of the books that you have inside of the course called the Wise Concise Trustee Handbook, Let's take a look at it here. Well, first, before I show you that, I want to show you that foreign states are nations and they are countries. Looking at the 1778 Constitution of South Carolina, if you look here, number one, it says that the style of this country be hereafter the state of South Carolina. All of the states are 50 countries on the North American continent, just like all of the countries in the South America continent or the countries in the Central America continent. North America is not a country by itself. It's comprised of 50 different countries. So I thought that's very interesting to take a look at, take note of. Now, going back to the Wise Concise Trustee Handbook, it's going to clarify what is a natural person. And if you look down at the bottom where um, the author is citing references, because remember I told you, trusts are not subject to legislative control or statutes. Look at Elliot B. Freeman. The court made it clear that the express trust is not subject to legislative control, right? Let's continue. There are others that we need to look at here. Right here. The trustees of an express trust are protected under the Constitution as citizens throughout the continental United States. Let's say the trustee that you have 
is a non-resident alien. They're not a U.S. citizen. They have no birth certificate, no driver's license, no green card, no legal permanent residence, no I-10 number, no social. They have nothing. But if they're under contract as a trustee, under contract of an express trust contract, they are protected under the Constitution as citizens. That is how powerful the trust is. It says the trustees under a will or declaration of the express trust are natural persons, citizens within the meaning of Article 4, Section 2 of the Constitution, and are therefore entitled to all the privileges and immunities of the same. And you can check out Paul v. Virginia, 75 U.S. 168 in the year 1868. Go and get that case law and get a certified copy of it so you may use it. If you are having, if you know someone who is a foreigner who's having trouble coming out of their country to come to the States, well, you need to make them a trustee of your express trust and have your express trust recorded down in the county with the clerk, and they can use that evidence for their application to come here. Avoid all the scrutiny that they've been going through. All right, let's continue here. So now what I want to do is look at one of those case laws that we read on Wikipedia. This is Wheaton and Donaldson versus Peters. Donaldson versus Peters. Now, again, these are artificial entities dishing it out over what kind of common law copyright um, or dishing it out over the rights. And they're talking about um, rights as an author that they should have a common law copyright to protect their labor, their intellectual property. Our intellectual property here is the name on the birth certificate. That's what we're going to uh, perfect by doing a trademark with the Secretary of State. What I would like to show you here, let's read. It says, it is presumed that the copyright recognized in the Act of Congress and which was intended to be protected by its provisions was the property which an author has by the common law in his manuscript, which would be protected by a court of chancery. Depending on your state, it could be a court of equity. And this protection was given as well to books published under the provisions of the law as to manuscript copies. Congress, by the Act of 1790, instead of sanctioning an existing perpetual right in an author in his works, instead, they created the right secured for a limited time by the provisions of that law. The right of an author to a perpetual copyright does not exist by the common law of Pennsylvania. Now that depends if the author is an artificial entity or a natural person. Who is the author when it comes to a natural person for our copyright? That will be the express trust itself, the beneficiary of the trust. It says no one can deny that where the legislature are about to vest an exclusive right in an author or in an inventor, in an inventor, they have the power to provide the conditions of which such right shall be enjoyed and that no one can avail himself of such right who does not substantially comply with the requisites of the law. This principle is familiar as it regards patent rights, and it is the same in relation to the copyright of a book. If any difference should be made as respect, as respects a strict conformity to the law, it would seem to be more reasonable to make the requirement of the author rather than of the inventor. The acts required by the laws of the United States to be done by an author to secure his copyright are in the order in which they must naturally transpire. First, the title of the book is to be deposited with the clerk down at the county. And the record he makes 
must be inserted in the first or second page. Then the public notice in the newspapers is to be given. And within six months after the publication of the book, a copy must be deposited in the Department of State. Now, this is not the US Department of State. This is your Secretary of State. In states like Florida, they call the Secretary of State the Department of State. They do that in Pennsylvania as well. So let's break this down. Are we actually authors here talking about a book? No, we're not. But on one side, we are. In our trust, what is the title of a book? What kind of books do we have? We have trustee minutes. We have agendas. We have amendments. Those are called books when it comes to the fully expressing the declaration of your trust. So your trustee minutes are the books and those are gonna consist of the information that talks about your copyright, uh, your copyright notice, your common law, copyright um, identification numbers, as well as the description of what you're trying to copyright and what you wanna trademark. Now that has to be listed with the clerk and we already do that with the information that you have when it comes to the, the Patreon courses and how to fill out the proper non-UCC and get that registered down in the clerk's office that way with the additional documents behind it, okay? Now, when it's talking about uh, must be inserted in the first or second page, those are the books. You get a book and a page number down at the county. Then the public notice in the, the newspaper. So you'll get a certified copy of your recording in the clerk's office and you'll make an affidavit, a declaration, and have that to be notarized. After that, that's going to be circulated in a local newspaper. It could be any newspaper company. I pr prefer the one that you've trusted to do your affidavit of domiciles or claim of ownerships, just like you would a DBA. You can send it directly with the newspapers that do your DBAs. After that, we will go ahead and go online and file our um, information with the Department of State. Now, how do you do that? That's a simple UCC-1. County is non-UCC, UCC-1 with the Department of State. And you guys have already done that. Those that are part of the Patriot community. Now we'll further perfect that with, um, there is a trademark section within the Secretary of State, AKA the Department of State. And I will go over that application here with you on how to fill that out. Here in California, it's $70. I don't know what the price is in your state. Could be more, could be less. But $70 is what it is here in California. All right, let's continue. So now we're gonna take a look at the actual Copyright Act of 1790. Okay, here we go. Section one it says, be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America and Congress assembled. See, it is not just the United States alone because that's the corporation. That's the federal corporation. What is this one? This is the de jure corporation. There are corporations on both sides. They've always been a corporation. Most people confuse that, that the United States was a de jure and now it's a de facto. It has always been a corporation. It's been, it was created to be that it, uh, ever since its inception of the Articles of Association. Think about it. Look at how the United States came about. Articles of Association, Declaration of Independence, Articles of Confederation. Then you get the United States of America and Congress assembled, and then you get the United States Constitution. That order is the same order you do when you create your LLC. You give a Secretary of State your Articles of Organization. Then you have what? A company. It's the very same thing. 
So this is the De Jour Corporation. That from and after the passing of this act, the author and authors of any map, chart, book, or books already printed within these United States being a citizen or citizens thereof or resident within the same, his or their, uh, his or their <clears throat> executors, administrators, or assigns who halt or have not transferred to any other person, the copyright of such map, chart, book, or books, share or shares thereof. And any other person or persons being a citizen or citizens of these United States or residents therein, his or their executors, administrators, or assigns who halt or have purchased or legally acquired the copyright of any such map, chart, book, or books in order to print, reprint, publish, or vend the same shall have the sole right and liberty of printing, reprinting, publishing, and vending such map, chart, book, or books for the term of 14 years from the recording, the title thereof in the clerk's office, as in herein after directed, and that the author and authors of any map, chart, book, or books already made and composed and not printed or published or that shall hereafter be made and composed being a citizen or citizens of these United States or residents therein and his or their executors, administrators or signs shall have the sole right and liberty of printing, reprinting, publishing and vending such map, chart, book or books for the like term of 14 years from the time of recording the title thereof in the clerk's office as aforesaid. That was a lot and still not finished. And if at the expiration of the said term, the author or authors or any of them be living and a citizen or citizens of these United States or resident therein, the same exclusive right shall be continued to him or them, his or their executors, administrators, or assigns for the further term of 14 years, provided he or they shall cause the title thereof to be a second time recorded and published in the same manner as in herein after directed and that within six months before the expiration of the first term of 14 years aforesaid. So you are supposed to copyright your information, your books, every 14 years. This is what publishers are supposed to do. You can't just leave it upon the United States Patent Office and be done every 14 years. So if I don't find your information, uh, where it should be with the clerk, and I want it, it's now up for grabs. I can contest. So every 14 years, you are going to do this process to refresh and let them know what is theirs and what is not theirs. Okay. So let's continue. Now we're going to go to the actual trademark website. And this is going to lead into something else as well. Like I said, with Nike, they use this information to escape taxes, right? Let me show you an article for Nike. See if we can find it here. Here we go. This is a easy article that you can find. I'll put the link in the description. It's uh, publicinterestnetwork.org. And it talks about many different corporations out there that utilize this trademark uh, feature. But if we go down to Nike here, it says the sneaker giant officially holds 6.7 billion offshore for tax purposes. I know in my example, I said 150 billion. That was off. 6.7 billion offshore for tax purposes and on which 
it would otherwise owe 2.2 billion in the United States taxes. So if they had run their business within the United States with no blanket, nothing, just running their business, they would have to pay 2.2 billion of the 6.7. That implies Nike pays a mere 2.2% tax rate to foreign governments on those offshore profits, suggesting nearly all of the money is held by subsidiaries in tax havens. Some of Nike's intellectual property, trademark, copyright, is owned by a subsidiary in the Netherlands, a tax haven that American companies often use to funnel profits to other tax havens like Bermuda. Nike discloses having 12 subsidiaries in Bermuda that actually bear the names of their shoes like Air Max Limited and Nike Flight. All of these names are trademark within different tax havens to avoid paying United States taxes. You're going to do the same with your own name so you can avoid taxation legally and lawfully. Don't get mad because they're doing it. Now you're going to do it. Monkey see, monkey do. So let's go to the trademark application. This is going to be the example of how to do it for California within the Secretary of State. And you will have to find the website for your state. Hopefully the questions are the same. I believe they are. But I, if not, I believe you can figure it out according to how we do this one. So let's go after it. The first one, registration type. Of course, it's going to be a trademark. And you would click next. Go to next, who is the owner registrant? This is where you would type the full name of your express trust. We're gonna fill out everything that would have an asterisk. So what is the address? This would be the foreign address that you've utilized on your SS4 application when you called the IRS to obtain your EIN number EIN number that was established on the zero file list. That's the address that goes here. Authorized representative information. It can be you or it can be your foreign trustee. I suggest the foreign trustee. Okay. You would list their name here. Acknowledgement of declaration of ownership. List their full name here. Business structure type. These are the options. These are all of those artificial entities. Corporation, limited liability company, limited partnership, general partnership, sole proprietor, spouse, community property. See, community property is tied into the community trust or the, uh, well, like the spouse community trust. And that's a domestic entity. Most people don't know that they have created all other trust out there outside of express trust so that they can control it within the US court and control test. So these are entities that you do not want to use. You would select other and you would type in trust. Okay. Number three, describe the design now what you would type in is utilizing the english alphabet the mark contains the words jane doe smith that's it because we're talking about the Certificate of Security, the name on the birth certificate, which then gives birth to the uncertificated security, the social security number. That's how they're getting you. It's those two numbers for everything. 
to lock you up in prison or to give you a court or some type of a, a court case or a sentencing. It starts with those two security. Taxation, it starts with those two security. All right. Disclaimer, this is only if, um, like for example, in their description here, it says Urias Brewing Company. If the applied mark is Urias Brewing Company and alcohol brewing is identified as the services provided, then the words brewing and company must be disclaimed. So our first middle last name is not identified as a service. So therefore this does not apply to us. Now, part B, the drawing page. All you have to do is open up a Word file, pages, Google Doc, and just type your name in all caps, just like the first, middle, last. Turn it into a PDF and upload it here. This is what the mark looks like. It doesn't have to look like a, a, a ribbon or anything like this with a star behind it. You're not doing that. Just leave it like this. I believe David Strait's example of this was to place it on an actual t-shirt and to have that mailed to yours or something like that of that nature. So all you need to do is just have it as a PDF here and upload it, okay? We can skip number C because it's not being translated into the English. We've already told them that it is, it is a part of the English alphabet. And date the mark was first used. What date are you going to use? I'll let you think about that for a second. What date are you going to use? Is it your birth date? Mm -hmm. Is it the date that the registrar entered your certificate into commerce? Is it your 18th birthday? Which is it? I'm gonna leave that up to you. You can do either or. I'll leave that to you. Design codes. There are no design codes here. Goods and services. Identification statement. If a trademark lists specific goods, all you have to type in is certificated, I'm sorry, certificated and uncertificated securities. That is what goes here. Now we have to select the trademark classification. I've already done that for you here. Uh, we have one trademark that we're focusing on and it's going to be under 16, paper goods and printed matter. This is the only one that pertains to chattel paper. Uh, in your state, you may find 036 or 035, which is insurance and finances. You can select that if that is an option for you. But for California, it will be 16. Go to the next. Has this mark been registered with the United States Patent and Trademark Office? No, we don't need that, according to the Act of 1790. Number seven, use of mark. Are we talking about the mark being on labels, tags? Of course, our name is not on the shelf unless you have a name like mine, but I have a full name and that's not on the shelves. It's not being branded, it's not being sold. Uh, maybe you want to do that. Maybe you have a unique name. You can select this as well. But for now, uh, you definitely want to select other because I doubt they're going to have that option in there for you. In other, you're going to type in uncertificated, comma, certificated, comma, comprehensive annual financing reports. That is where the money is held. Everyone who is into this whole secure party creditor world and all of that 
um, all of those false teachings out there. They really want to go after how to discharge and how to get the money, how to do trust collapse. And that's what a lot of people are waiting for. That's all they care about, really. Uh, unfortunately, um, that's a whole nother discussion. But the comprehensive annual financial reports is where all of the money is sitting with your county treasurer or your county comptroller. And that money is coming from the, the birth certificate. That's why they even create a birth certificate. Okay. That's so what's down there. So that is a description of your trademark of what kind of services it provides within the county. B, specimen showing the mark. Again, you're going to hit other. And the type of specimen that is going to display your trademark, it's being displayed on the U.S. Stock Exchange with NASDAQ, right? And the company that is doing that for them is called the Depository Trust Corporation, the DTC. So you would write Depository Trust Corporation in this box here. All right. Specimen upload. Now, this is where you can upload a copy of your authenticated birth certificate that has been authenticated on every level of government. OK, <clears throat> if your birth certificate was signed by a public health officer, then you need to go down to the same office where you got the birth certificate and do what's called um, a process of exemplification. They will authenticate his signature. After that, you now take it to the secretary of state to be authenticated. And after that, you take it to the Secretary of State in Washington, DC, the Virginia office to be authenticated. If, you, if yours is regular and it's signed by just the, the standard county registrar and it's not signed by the public health officer, then you don't need to do exemplification. You can just go straight to the Secretary of State followed by the Department of State's office in Virginia. So you can scan that once you have it uh, received and please keep that do not give it away to any any agency never mail that off never send it to the passport um, agencies for obtaining a passport just do a regular birth certificate but please please do not let that out of your sight so scan it when you have it all done upload it right here that is a specimen upload of what your mark looks like, okay? That's what you wanna trademark. So you go to next. After that, you just review everything that you've inputted and then you make the payment. Here in California, it is $70. If I want a certified copy of it, I will pay 75, okay? So that's gonna be it on how to do the trademark. Trademark is very, very useful. Uh, you will utilize it when it comes to the taxes. What are we talking about here? 1040s, right? The 1040 form. Let's say you've made 90,000 as an employee and you filed that you are tax exempt all year long. They didn't take out any state taxes. They didn't take out any federal taxes. Now you're wondering, okay, what do I do? I got the trust, but what do I do with the social? This is what you would do. I'm not going to show it all in detail because there is a, a, a very unique process to this. But the 1040 is in play here, as well as other forms. You'll find out when you fill out this form, you have to get other forms that goes with it. Right? You, you would definitely need other forms. Um, your trust has to file as well as you have to file. The trust is gonna use a 1041, right? Here is the 1041. This is where the trust is gonna be filing, utilizing its specific 98 number. So what matters is this. 
You want to get it to the point to where you're going to get a refund for all the expenses that was done. So there's a lot of forms that have to be utilized to do this. But we will get into that in another video. Uh, that's most likely going to be done for a specific group who has completed everything that they needed to complete in the Patreon class. And I think that's going to go into next year before we're ready to discuss how to do the proper filings for your trust and the trademark name, which is the, the 1040, the name on the 1040, the Inslegis, the straw man. You see, trusts do not pay taxes and it has the ability to get monies back where the straw man could never do that. That is what we mean by the foreign trust being a creditor over the debtor, the ends legis. The trust is not a secured party creditor. It is a secured party. And because the ends legis is listed as the debtor, therefore that makes the trust a creditor. Okay, so we'll get into that later. But for now, I wanted to show you how to do the trademark. If you need any additional help with how to put these documents together, uh, you, you got to get into the Patreon course at www.patreon.com forward slash the zero percent, which will be in the description below. And uh, please check out the introduction video there so you understand how to navigate Patreon and what it is all about and how to get things, things started. So with that being said, that's going to be it for this video. It was a little bit long. Um, I will try to make additional content to help you guys with understanding this information. As always, I will see you in Patreon. And if you are there, I will see you next Saturday for our Zoom class for any questions that you may have about the process. Signing off. Thank you. Bye-bye.